Uh, as you said, my name is Parker Whiteman. I work for Lucidchart, and I'm just going to start by giving you a quick introduction to what Lucidchart is uh, and the story of how we brought it to the iPad. So, Lucidchart is a. Is it going to start? No. Well, this was a video. Sorry, technical difficulties. I was going to present from the iPad, but we couldn't get an adapter, so I've sent this to my Mac now, and it uh, may be misbehaving. I'm sorry about that. But this was a video that showed you how Lucidchart worked, but I will describe it in vivid detail. Um, so over here on the left, you have the shape, uh, your shape manager. You can drag some shapes in uh, and draw arrows between them. Okay, and and then those arrows stay connected, so you can move the nodes, and the arrows will stay connected. And um, and then it has a full-featured text rendering system, so you can, you know. Bold, italic, underline—you know all the all the text styling that uh, you could imagine as well. Okay, so Lucidchart is a fully featured, uh, you know, quote desktop class application that runs in the web. So it's all run on JavaScript, HTML, and CSS, and works in all major browsers. Okay, so bringing this to the iPad um, required—we uh, we had a set of requirements. So this this approach that we took and that I'm going to describe today is not what I would prescribe for everyone that wants to uh, leverage JavaScript in their application, but it worked out pretty well for us, and it was based on a particular set of requirements that we had. <clears throat> okay, so we needed to leverage our pre-existing JavaScript code base where feasible, and I'll explain a little bit more later about why that is. It's highly interactive, so it's, we wanted it to have high frame rates and, and work at the speed that the user is thinking and wants to work. We were a small team, so we only have about three mobile developers hired one year ago, almost exactly, and about 25 you know, web developers uh, at any given time that might be working on Lucidchart as a web product. We wanted it to feel like a very professional and capable tool. People are making very large uh, technical documentation and that kind of thing in our tool, so we want it to um, feel professional to them. And we want it to feel very native to the platform. So right now we want, we're supporting iOS, but we hope to do Android at some point. And when we do Android, we don't want to prescribe all of the, the, loose, or the iOS design UI paradigms on Android. Um, different platforms mean different UI paradigms. So for example, in iOS, because there's no hardware back button, uh, you need a software back button everywhere. But that might not be the ideal experience on Android. So we want a system that allows us that flexibility uh, to design the Chrome of our application um, separate from like the core editing experience. We wanted to be able to adopt new iOS features quickly. This came up when we had planned to release in July. So we actually released this iPad app that I'm going to demo in a second uh, last week. And it got featured on, uh, in the productivity category by Apple as uh, using multitasking. So iOS has a new multitasking view that, they, uh, that we were told we were a shoe in for because we're a productivity app. And so we only had a month or two to implement this new feature. And it essentially meant we needed to build an iPhone application. So we needed to adopt these new features quickly. And we um, luckily had a setup that allowed us to do that. And we wanted it to be maintainable over the long term. So to speak to these. Uh, a little more concretely, um, leveraging our existing JavaScript. So we have hundreds of thousands of lines of JavaScript that handle everything in uh, the editing experience. So from rendering all the shapes on your diagram to real-time collaboration, lots of JavaScript that handles all that, and we would like to leverage as much of that as possible um, so that we don't have to rewrite a lot. But we also don't want to sacrifice user experience. So there's a balance. Uh, we, and just to be clear, we really do render everything ourselves. So when you see text on a shape, we are not using the fonts text. We've actually converted fonts to a JavaScript font format um, that we make, and then those get converted into essentially Canvas, Line 2, Arc 2, draw calls, and we draw all those fonts ourselves. And uh, text highlighting and bolding and italic, we've essentially reproduced the entire text editing experience so that it's pixel perfect on every browser and across every device. Okay, so, so that stuff like this doesn't happen. Um, early in Lucidchart, when we tried to, to use the uh, browser's font rendering, we could never quite get away from stuff like this, right? Where <laughs> on Safari, maybe it renders how it does there on the far left, but in Firefox, due to just 
you know, whatever variations in font rendering, you get different, uh, different text spacing. Uh, and that's no good from a visual application where people are building large technical documentation. They want it to be consistent. This would not be acceptable in Word or other applications as you switch between Mac and PC, for example. So, uh, so this is a hard requirement. We don't want, we want rendering to be exact and therefore we want to leverage all that JavaScript code that does our rendering. Okay, we also want it to feel native to the platform. So this means stuff like inertial scrolling, paging between elements, the bounce that you get at the bottom of a list, um, transitioning between views in your application, all of that comes for free. And by free, I mean you would have to reproduce those if you did those all in JavaScript. Uh, and adopting platform-specific UI pays lots of dividends in the long term, so this contributes to maintainability. And uh, I'm just bringing up my notes. Okay, so for example, uh, the bane of all web developers' existence is retina images and displays, uh, and Xcode makes that very easy to do. So if, if you used Xcode's tools the way they were designed, you would just give a PDF for all your images, and when the iPhone 6 Plus came out last year and you had all these 3X images now instead of 2X, you just recompiled your application and everything worked. You didn't have to do anything extra. Size class is an auto layout, so this is iOS's CSS, so to speak, um, how you lay out your application and, uh, and flow things and create constraints. So it's a constraint-based system where you, you attach views to other views and set spacers and, and uh, align things. And if you're trying to make your app feel like an iOS application, Auto Layout makes it easy to do that. App Thinning was just released in iOS 9. If you had adopted Auto Layout and, and the way that they produce their 1x, 2x, and 3x images, then Apple will for you uh, before delivering it to the customer, cut out all of the image assets that aren't required by that platform. Okay, so if you have an iPhone 6 and the 6 uses 2x images, it'll cut out all the 1x and 3x images from your download. So you don't have all those images on your device that you never use. Um, so it's a way of decreasing download size. Um, adaptive view controllers, I'll demo that in a second. Um, but again, a way to make it so that on a large iPad and a small you know, iPhone 4S, you still, uh, it's manageable and it looks right for the platform, okay? So, and then iOS 10 is gonna come this year, you know, what else are they gonna bring uh, that they'll surely make it much easier to adopt into than having to reproduce in JavaScript. So, this is all to say that we already have actually an all JavaScript mobile editor. So if you go on an iPad to lucidchart.com slash demo, you can try out our all JavaScript editor. And you'll see that we've gone to great lengths to try to reproduce a lot of stuff that comes for free in iOS. Um, and not great, honestly. It, it, we try to reproduce them, but any iOS user would feel that it felt wonky or didn't feel quite right. So, um, so you can go try that out. But, so to demo real quick, hopefully this just works, yay. Okay, so this is, uh, it runs slower on the simulator, that's why I wanted to do it on the iPad, because it runs buttery smooth. Um, but this is a very large document that describes Iron Man suit. So, um, okay, so in the old editor, this, this diagram probably would have crashed before um, using our old JavaScript approach. Um, and this is still a JavaScript approach, but we're using WebGL, uh, which I'll talk about later. But anyway, we, uh, this is a large document. You can see that it fits on an iPad. And, but everything that you see in this boundary here on the canvas is all rendered in JavaScript. This is 100% JavaScript, all of this, okay? But then this, Chrome around the top, this is all native Chrome. Okay, so if I pull something up, uh, you'll see that as I click between elements, down here my, my little style panel is updating to the thing that I'm clicked on. Okay, so there's this interaction happening between the web view and the native application, and they're interacting and communicating in real time, and you wouldn't necessarily guess um, that this inner part was a web view, because uh, it works pretty well, right? So we can pop this up here. Again, this is a native dialog. As users scroll around, it gets the natural scrolling that they're used to. It feels just like the iOS applications that they know and love as they page between pages that reacts just like they expect. Uh, and this is a little native panel, and then we click it. And we tell the JavaScript to play something. Okay, so these, so uh, 
So you wouldn't really guess that this was mostly powered by JavaScript. The native stuff is actually very dumb. It doesn't do a whole lot. It just tells the web view what to do. Okay. So, um, but again, you get a lot of UI stuff for free. So for example here, when I have the big large iPad, um, iOS users are used to seeing this modal in the middle of their screen. Uh, in iOS 9, they introduced multitasking, so you can pull in an app from the side, okay? And then I can actually make these split screen, and it adapts, but when I get to a certain width, it actually changes to more of like an iPhone format. And for me, it goes full screen and adapts to the size of the application. And again, this comes for free because we're using iOS. Um, and so similarly, so Apple has, they've, they've created a paradigm called size classes where you have regular width or compact width and regular height or compact height. And using those, you can adapt to the device that you're on and those are primitives that Apple caters to and will pay dividends in the future. So it's very nice to be able to adopt those uh, without having to reproduce them in JavaScript. So, um, so again, this is all native. These thumbnails are actually generated by the JavaScript and given to the native code. Okay, and so I can go in here. Right, we have our little shape panel here. You can pull stuff in, um, and so on and so forth. Okay, so this is the application. Um, and that's basically the gist of it. But okay, we'll come back and demo a few times. So previously, our Java, our editor was all JavaScript. Um, so the there's lots of components to the editor, but the major ones are the Chrome, um, which are the bars on the top and bottom, and that kind of thing. The canvas, the actual rendering of your shapes. And then the business logic came. Okay? And the business logic handles stuff like real-time collaboration. So if someone was on this document with me right now, it would be updating in real time just like Google Docs. And uh, that's all handled in the JavaScript. The native doesn't even have to worry about it. Okay? So essentially, we, uh, all we did was move the Chrome into native and keep the rest in JavaScript. Okay? So it seems kind of obvious. No, no biggie there. Um, but it turns out this wasn't actually a feasible approach until last year about this time, because um, iOS introduced some new technologies, okay? So to sort of explain some history about why uh, this wasn't really feasible before, uh, before the only web view that you could show in your application, <laughs> so in iOS you have um, a view, just like you might have a button or or a scrolling list, you can have a web view in your application and you can put it anywhere on your screen, you can make it any size you want, um, and lots of apps use this. So if you're in the Facebook application and you tap a link and it brings up a web browser to a Forbes article or something, you're probably using UI web view. Or at least until iOS 8 you surely were. Um, so UI web view had really poor JavaScript performance uh, due to restricted security permissions. So. There was lots of uh, malicious things you could do if, um, uh, in terms of like JIT compilation and all the optimizations that Apple performs in Safari. And so uh, they restricted that heavily and so performance was very degraded in the UI web view. And communication from, from the native app to the web view, it was, it was decent. So uh, on the web view, you'd call evaluate JavaScript You'd give it some JavaScript text, it would evaluate it, and it would return to you a result. So if you were doing math, it would give you back the number, um, or maybe a string that was the number, I don't remember. But anyway, you could tell the alert view, or sorry, you could tell the web view things to do, okay? Um, communication from web view to native was eyes bleedingly terrible. Uh, essentially what you did was you did a fake uh, redirect. You'd redirect the web view to some known fake URL, and then, iOS has, like, has a callback where before it redirects to any URL, it asks you, should I redirect to this URL? Uh, and so it was used as a hack where they would check to see what the host was, and if it was fakeplace.com, then they would get the path, grab the path, which was maybe some base64 encoded JSON or whatever your message was. They'd grab that off, they'd parse it, and then they'd return false, so the web view wouldn't actually redirect to that URL, okay? So this is not a scalable approach, uh, as you might imagine. And so it was very difficult to communicate from the web view to native, okay? So it would have restricted the kind of things we were trying to do in our application. So then came along 
WK WebView. So WK WebView was introduced in iOS 8 um, in September 2014. And you know what? I just realized. Nope. Just kidding. Uh, introduced to iOS 8. So JS performance is similar to Safari because it runs in a separate process. So uh, everything related to the JavaScript um, parsing and optimization runs in a separate process and then it just renders it in your application uh, with essentially no latency, which is surprising. Um, Safari is considered the new IE by popular culture nowadays, um, but it's certainly not true of their J JavaScript performance. JavaScript, JavaScript core smokes V8 in almost every uh, benchmark by quite a bit, um, and Apple's doing some great things in JavaScript performance. So you get all those benefits in WK WebView. Uh, it also supports WebGL. Uh, previous to using WebGL, we always used Canvas elements, um, and so we, we have various rendering approaches. If you go to Lucitart's tech blog, um, there's a write-up about all the approaches we've gone through rendering over the time, over over the years to get more sophisticated to handle older devices as well and newer devices as well and so on and so forth. Um, WebGL is our newest approach and it scales very well on the iPad and can handle large documents, which the previous Canvas-based editor could not. And it has a prop proper message passing interface and I put three asterisks because uh, there are caveats galore with that uh, that we'll get into. But from the web view, uh, you can now pass messages to the native app in a supported a uh, more scalable way. Essentially looks like um, this, that's probably a little hard to see, but essentially uh, the important part here is you, you add a script handler with some name called notifications, for example. And then you can register a callback that uh, whenever the JavaScript sends a message, you can handle that message. And, uh, and grab something out of it, and you can check whether it's, uh, what its name is. I didn't put that in the code there, but you could say if it was the name, or the notifications callback, then do some special code. And from the JavaScript, you would call something like this, window.webkit.messagehandlers.notifications. So notifications is the name that I registered up above. Um, and then you'd post message, and you can send basically anything that can be encoded in, as JSON. Uh, so null, numbers, strings, JSON objects, and arrays, and those get converted to the iOS data structures for you, so you don't have to manually parse them, which is nice. They also have a more granular native uh, to WebView, so you still have the evaluate JavaScript option, but you also have some other options where before you even uh, load a URL, you can say every time a U URL is loaded, uh, execute this JavaScript at uh, document start or document end. So before the, the DOM gets loaded or after the DOM gets loaded. Um, so a little bit more granularity there. Uh, you can also load from a file. So you can load like normally from a URL. Uh, and if any iOS programmers are out there, I've purposely uh, not done the exact calls here, so these are wrong. <laughs> so, uh, but iOS has very long method names and I had to fit them on a slide, so trimmed them down. Um, or you can load from an HTML string and a base URL. So, uh, so essentially you give it a string and then you say, pretend like this string is from lucidchart.com. And it will obey all the security policies as if you had actually loaded something from lucidchart.com. So as far as like cross origin security things, it would obey those as if it really got this HTML from uh, .com. So, uh, which is nice, but then also as a caveat, which is coming up. But this makes it so that you can render things offline or cached HTML. So we actually have our JavaScript, again, it's hundreds of thousands of lines. It's heavily minified with the Google Closure compiler, and it still clocks in at like three to five megabytes or something. And so that's a lot of JavaScript to every time you load a document to download it from the server uh, and then parse it all. So we actually download it in the background and then, uh, and then just execute the cached version, and then we check for updates occasionally. So um, we can actually update this JavaScript any time if there's a bug in it, which is nice. Um, okay, so there's some caveats that caused us some issues. So again, it's all been roses um, thus far. Uh, 
and um, maybe doesn't seem revolutionary uh, if you've never done any of this stuff before and tried to make a hybrid application, but um, it uh, has some drawbacks. Um, we got around them all, luckily, but they were not pretty. So for one, if your web is on screen, it will not execute JavaScript, if it's not on screen, it will not execute JavaScript and it will ignore all calls to evaluate JavaScript. So this is a problem when your web view drives your entire application. <clears throat> and uh, so for example, okay, so here, um, if I go back to my docs list, okay, so when we load the document, we don't wanna pop up the interface and not have nothing there, right? So we wanted to have a spinner, and then when it was done loading, um, have a pop up from the bottom, okay? But if it's not on screen, then it doesn't load JavaScript and therefore it would never load. So we actually have to put it off screen where you can't see it, wait for it to load, then take it out and then present it from the bottom. So uh, that sucked. Um, and then, uh, so off screen background loading. View controller transitions remove the view below if covered. So what this means is that, oh no, that's what I wanted. Sorry, getting used to this, okay. So over here, uh, we have this dialog here. So it turned out that if you're in this sort of smaller size class and pages render completely covering uh, the thing below it, then it removes the view underneath, right? So it's not even visible, so iOS 4U just removes that view um, from the view hierarchy so it can save 12 megabytes of, of, uh, of uh, image data. And uh, which is great for memory, um, but it means that if this view is being powered by your web view, which it is, so like when I hit the plus button here, we're telling the web view, hey, create a new page, and then it calls us back with the pages. Uh, that won't happen um, because your view is now off screen. So you can tell iOS to do that, uh, to present over the screen instead of remove it. But by doing that, it behaves differently than it would otherwise. You'd think like, oh, it's the exact same, except um, but it's not, because for example, this status bar that's normally controlled by, uh, by iOS, now it turns dark when this presents, which it would not do if it was removing the view behind. Anyway, um, just some weird quirks around this, and this is still a remaining bug in our product that we haven't fixed yet. Um, but it was an acceptable casualty, it had to be. So, um, hey, Keynote, where are you? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed it did. Uh, wow, did it really? Indeed it did, okay. All right, let's get back here. Okay, so um, another caveat is there's no way to compact way to send binary data between the native and web view. Um, unless you consider base64 encoding binary data compact. Um, uh, there's about like a, uh, ends up being like a 37% increase if you base64 encode. Um, so we actually do that. Uh, in certain places where we know images are small, so for example here in this shape manager, um, the JavaScript is actually rendering all these, base64 encoding the data and then sending it back to us. So if I enable, uh, what's one that is, uh, we'll do this one. So if I enable some other libraries, and then I go to those libraries, you'll see for a split second that they actually, there's a spinner. Oh, loaded them fast. Anyway, it's fast, it goes fast, but it actually has to wait for the WebView to render all those and pass them all back. And we base64 encode it, and works well enough, but um, we don't quite do it for all of our, um, uh, all the images. I'll explain that in a minute, but, the message passing interface, as great as it was, leaked memory super bad. So, you can't really see it in this screenshot, but this screenshot on the left essentially shows that the app grew from 100 megabytes to 600 megabytes consumed just by like browsing around in the application. Um, not really doing much, it was just the web view sending stuff to the native app, and it was leaking all those messages. So I created like a reproducible like three line JavaScript thing that had like a set interval and just passed like one character strings over the bridge, and that's what caused this. Um, 
And then over on the right here, this is the, uh, that shows, if you pause the Xcode application while it's frozen, it'll show you all the threads that are running, and that's 2,048 threads of JavaScript garbage collection that are running. So, which is the maximum. So we went to WWDC and asked them about this. And they were like, well, that's as many as it can allocate. And I was like, yeah, it seems like too many. Um, and uh, anyway, but they fixed it in iOS 9. So um, not a problem. We did have to, um, for various reasons, use a local web server in our application. <laughs> um, and this approach would have been feasible with UI WebView as well. But um, due to the memory leaks and also the fact that we needed, we needed we couldn't always use Base64 encoded image data. We needed URL sometimes. So if you have like an image tag and you need to set its source, you can't use binary data. Or yeah, Base64 encoded data to do that, you need a URL. So, um, or at least um, our implementation did. So we essentially had a system like this where the JavaScript could hook into the native app and say fetch this URL, and then we would call them back with a URL and that URL was either a localhost URL that pointed to our local web server, um, or if there was some error occurred and the native app couldn't fetch it, we would just give them back the original URL, and then it would use its normal error handling process. Um, so this helped for a lot of things. Uh, one, it was required because of the memory leak, but it uh, also made it so we could cache all the image data. So you can actually load all your documents offline um, as long as you've loaded them once before, because uh, we had cached all those fonts and images and JavaScript and JSON that you need. Uh, so it really helped out in that approach. WK WebView uh, got sad when we would load HTTP from HTTPS domains. Um, so, uh, which is reasonable, it's a, a security concern, but wasn't in this case. Uh, so it was a warning in iOS 8, uh, but an error in iOS 9, womp womp. So, uh, so this meant that, it, for everything but images. So we only passed three things over the wire, images, um, between native and the web view, we passed images, JSON, and JavaScript. So we, uh, images still actually worked because it, that one happens to still be a warning, <laughs> um, but the other two errors. So, but since they fixed it in iOS 9, they fixed the message passing interface, we just use that for JSON and JavaScript and then uh, still use the web server for images. But we are playing with fire here, right? In iOS 10, they could make images an error instead of a warning, and then we'd have to base64 encode all image data, right? And that's a bridge we'll have to cross when we come to it, but this is a pretty unique use case to our application. Um, so I, I wouldn't anticipate that all applications would run into this same problem. Uh, we used WebGL uh, to render the canvas, and WebGL is actually really nice because you, you know how much memory you're using. One problem with a canvas approach is that you just draw to your heart's content, but you have no idea without using heuristics like you know, how many shapes are on page, how big are they. You can maybe guess at how much memory you're using. But with WebGL, you know exactly the number of bytes that you are rendering and how much you're using in memory. So we have a lot more control over how much we render. And so when we render really large documents like this one, um, it only renders the part of the screen that it needs to, and it knows that, uh, like, hey, I, I'm running out of memory, so I need to render these fonts at a lower resolution because I'm scaled out, and so on and so forth. So uh, that ended up being a great boon for us for performance. So if you use on device, which you can just out here, we'll have the iPad set up, um, you'll see that it's buttery smooth. And even on really old devices, it's not a great frame rate, but it's definitely usable on an iPhone 4S, which is impressive. So. Uh, one caveat, though, is that anti-aliasing does not work in iOS for some reason. Uh, there's a flag you can give to WebGL and say, do open uh, anti-aliasing. And it's, it's very noticeable. Uh, all devices do it nowadays, so it's sort of something we're just used to. But when you see something that doesn't have anti-aliasing, it's very obvious. It doesn't have those smooth corners. So essentially what we do is re-render the canvas at 150% times its size and then shrink it down, <laughs> which uh, works. Like. Uh, you, you probably wouldn't have known unless I told you, but if you look closely, you might see that it's not true anti-aliasing. Um, anyway, so I'm almost out of time, but lastly, uh, the bridging interface across all these, um, there's a few custom commands that we send across the interface, but essentially the entire interface is in properties and commands. And so what I mean by that is, so, when I have something selected, and I pull up this bottom bar down here um, that has all my layout stuff, 
we just have, we have a property interface where anytime a color changes, so if I were to zoom in here, okay, uh, and I change this to green or it's a darker color, okay. So if I do that to this to red, you'll see that as I change over here, uh, that it's changed to white, right? So it's reflecting whatever I've selected, which is what you would expect. Um, but it's essentially built on a primitive of we have properties that we can query whether they're editable currently. So there's some shapes where maybe you can't change their fill color. Um, and then we can check their current values. And then it, uh, it tells us every time a property might have changed. So, if, so in this case, when I'm clicking off of this, the web view is telling us, hey, you might want to check your fill color again. It's changed. Um, and so we check the fill color. We see that it's changed, and we update it. Um, and essentially, the entire interface is made up of these properties. So once we getting that infrastructure in place, it was only a, um, a few days to actually wire all of these up and, and get them sending messages back over to the web view. So in an interface like this, building on strong primitives um, is often helpful. So anyway, uh, so that you can do less custom message passing and, and conform more to interfaces that are predictable. But anyway, that's all I had. If there's any questions. Yep. Right. Uh, yeah, definitely to some degree. So there, there are cases where, like, if you're in the native app, you want to use this like custom message passing interface. But if you're on desktop, you just want to go to the web directly. You know. So there definitely is some of that. In general, Lucidchart is actually a very well architected system. So for example, having a, 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 a custom rendering and all the UI hints that we put on screen and whatnot, um, like all this orange, you know, orange stuff and the different stuff that we do to highlight things. Um, the application happened to be architected such that, that was, this was already um, accounted for. So I, it, it definitely is in places, but I would say much less than it otherwise could have been. Um, so we were, I came on a year ago, but Lucid has been a product for a number of years, and it just happened to be pretty well architected when we started. So um, it ended up not being too bad, but that's definitely a concern in, in sort of refactoring you know, your rendering layer from your, your layout layer and all that sort of stuff really helps um, cut down on that. Yeah. Uh, yes, so we um, didn't for a long, so Lucidrop for a very long time did not uh, have a mobile application, or the one that they did build um, crashed on large documents and sort of had problems, but we, um, it's, it's one of those things where from a business aspect, it's definitely not as heavily used as the web, and it, and it probably never will be, and that's totally fine, but it's one of those things that definitely enterprises, it's, it's for some just a, a checkbox to check, right? Um, but others actually do find lots of use. So we, we speak with customers every day that, that, uh, that are using iPad only, and they actually don't know the web product exists or, or choose not to use it. So um, the, market, the market is definitely smaller than, than web, but our business team determined it valuable enough to hire a team and solve the problem, so. Cool, thank you.